Welcome to Progress in San Diego. Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things. I'm your host, Walter Davis. And we're continuing with part two on a series in which we are talking about what is occurring with the family court system. Um, on our last interview, we talked about how poverty was being affected by some of the actions of the family court systems throughout the world. And we had a discussion about what's occurring here in San Diego County uh, with our family court system. And uh, with me uh, once again, I have Miss Eileen Theofanos Lasher of the California Coalition for Families and Children. And welcome back to the show Thank once you. again, Eileen. Nice to see you again. Well, great. Well, we had this really great conversation and we've had a number of conversations uh, about this over the past few months regarding the illegal actions that are occurring within the family court system. Now, can you talk to me right now about this Miners Council? What is the Miners Council okay. and what's going on with that right now? Uh, the Miners Council is a court-appointed attorney who is supposed to represent the children. And in a high-conflict case, um, most often, a court-appointed minors counsel is appointed to represent the children because the parents are fighting and it's, the court needs to know what's going on with the children. So the county pays the court-appointed minors counsel. In other words, the taxpayers are paying. So my case um, is so bad that the minors counsel, Marsha Ornstein, is not accurately reporting to the court what her clients are saying. She's actually stating the opposite in order to keep that check coming. So I actually went to the county council, specifically Nathan Northrup, and I was concerned and I wanted her billing. And I received a letter from the county council that they do not keep individual accounting on the court appointed minors council. So there's no record keeping. So what has that resulted in? What that has resulted in, I received a call from Henry Coker from the San Diego Public Defender's Office, who previously had jurisdiction over receiving complaints about the court appointed minors council. And I explained to Henry Coker that my case is not being resolved because the accurate information is not being given by the court appointed minors counsel as to even the location of my children. So Henry Coker explained to me that he's received numerous complaints about the court appointed attorney for the children in these high conflict cases. And so much so that the spending is out of control, that the state has actually taken it away from the county and placed a cap on the spending. So the taxpayers really need to understand that this isn't just about two people fighting getting a divorce. This is their tax dollars being used to fund this criminal enterprise, which is basically servicing family law attorneys. So you're telling me in a time where we have fire departments that are shutting down in the city of San Diego on yes. any on given days, Yes. a time where our roads, we don't have money to repair our roads, where we're cutting back on police officers because there's not enough money, our library hours are being cut because mm -hmm. there's not enough money. You're saying to me, that these court appointed councils are getting paid so much money that is not being kept track of and is out of control Correct. so much to the point that the state of California has had to take over the spending or the, the program for the county of San Diego. Correct. And these court appointed minors councils wear different hats. They are appointed a court appointed minors council. They are family law attorneys, so they already have their own business. So this is supplementing their income. And they also are attorneys in probate court. So you have this kind of uh, corrupt, inefficient haven for these attorneys. 
So these people are wearing different hats. And, and so what I heard before on one of our other interviews is that, for example, uh, there is a way that they appoint themselves as an evaluator of some nature, and then they refer it back as a mediator, and they go back and forth. Can, can you elaborate further and correctly on well, that? Well, the high conflict case is uh -huh. really the source of a lot of income for these attorneys. So mm -hmm. you have, in the high conflict case, you have the family law specialist that the litigant goes to. And since it's high conflict, because you've got a middle class litigant who's got some money coming in, you have to, the court has to appoint a court appointed minors counsel and a psychological evaluator. Mm -hmm. So, and it's always the same it's the same 12 evaluators that are used over and over because they have that county contract. So, so they're working to kind of assist these attorneys mm -hmm. to keep that litigation going and job security going for all of these parties, for the court-appointed minors counsel, the court-appointed psychological evaluator, which is never appointed in a low-income family because there's no assets to loot. There's so, nothing there. So you're saying that low-income families are not treated the same as families that have assets. No, I'm, uh, yes, that's true. I'm saying that these litigants that go in that are determined to have assets are a target, simply a commodity for these attorneys. The children are commodities, and they are disposed of once the children age out and turn 18, after the money is looted, then it's over. So you're talking about retirement funds being looted, education funds for the children being right. looted, et cetera. Right. How long did your case? It's still going. And My case is still going. And How long? Um, since 1995. So the, the game of kick the can has been quite lucrative for the attorneys involved. And specifically, my ex-husband's attorney, Dave Shulman, has been on the case since 1996. And every time we go to court, the last time we went to court, it just gets continued another six months. The last time we went to court was November, and Commissioner McKenzie looked at the file and said, how did this happen? We've never had a case management. I don't know what's going on. So I don't know how there is not an examination of this increase in the high conflict cases even the amount of volumes in these cases should generate an investigation. Now, you're part of the California Coalition for Families and Children. How prevalent is this, uh, your type of scenario? How prevalent is that within the It's the same coalition? pattern over and over and over. Initially, I thought, this is, I've, I, I can't believe this. And, and the attorney, I would get a new attorney because it just would not get resolved. And the new attorney would say, I've never seen this before. Well, recently I attended a meeting, and that's how I met these other litigants. There were 50 litigants in the room. Mike Aguirre spearheaded the meeting, and everybody got up and told this story. It's the same story over and over again. So again, I go back to a white collar crime. It's essentially a financial crime. And these attorneys are getting away with it because they're bringing new money constantly into the court system so everyone is making money but the litigant is being victimized so, so it's it's I a scam to, it's a I, I want to encourage our studio audience that if if you are listening to this and you've been affected in this way uh, and you want to get in touch with the California Coalition for Families and Children there will be a telephone number and website that appears at the end of the broadcast uh, please get in touch with me so that I can put you in touch with Eileen and you can become part of the California Coalition for Families and Children uh, in an effort to document uh, these, these incidences and to uh, perhaps make a difference in terms of what's happening to California families. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go, go on. Well, I mean, with the prosecution of the attorney, Teresa Erickson, who was running a baby selling ring in probate court, I read the article that was written by Greg Moran of the San Diego Union Tribune. And it mentions in the article that Damon Mosler, within the San Diego District Attorney's Office, is in charge of the Special Operations Unit. He actually should have 
detected this baby selling ring. I contacted him and I said, you have a pattern of falsifying documents in family court, which is actually under the same supervisor, Judge Lauren Alksney, as the probate court. So you really need to investigate this pattern and the looting of high, they're red flagged as high conflict, and that's the buzzword for let's churn this case. The attorneys are just simply churning these cases. Issues are not getting resolved. The court is being deceived. The record is being deceived. And litigants are being harmed. They're being victimized right inside the courtroom. So the last time we had an interview months ago, it was indicative that the courts here in San Diego County are the only ones in the state that are not following the rules of court. Right. Has there been a change in that that you know of? Uh, I believe that there was a form that was supposed to be attached which would actually keep track of the attorney fees and Channel 10 did an investigation and Judge Lorna Alksney admitted that this form was not being attached to these high conflict cases and promised effective January, I, I don't even know if it's been implemented, but I also know that the head of the San Diego Bar, Mr. Lesh, wrote a letter to all the attorneys, just backdate the form and stick it in the high conflict files. So for whatever reason, the attorneys have chosen their financial interest over the interests of the public. Which is well documented with, with the Channel 10 interview. Right. The, the findings that the San Diego court system is not following the rules of court. Right. And most recently with the state of California taking over the, what was the term? Court appointed uh, mi minors, minors counsel. counsel, correct. Minors counsel has been taken over in terms of supervisory capacity by the state of California. Right. Right, and it's, but the problem is still, it's still status quo. So what is the call to action? What can the, the residents here in San Diego County do uh, in order to combat this? I think that they should call um, Damon Mosler of the San Diego District Attorney's Office Special Operations Unit and request that he investigate this as a financial crime. And I suggest that they call Jason Forge of the U.S. Attorney's Office and request that he expand his prosecution to include the attorneys that are falsifying the documents in family court. Because if, if no one's held, obviously they're doing this because they can. There is no accountability. There is no consequence for holding a litigant hostage and looting everything that they have. So they make an evaluation of these families in terms of their financial uh, wealth before these types of referrals occur. Exactly. So there is an evaluation done. There's a financial yes. evaluation. And the trend is, is that in general people that are, are of, of middle income, a higher middle income. Are targets. Are targets. Correct. That people of lesser income are not as much. Right. And it's the same attorneys that are doing this over and over and over again. So it appears that it's not the welfare of the children that is really the focus of no. this court system. No. And I actually testified before the Board of Go Governors at the California State Bar. And they have been advised by the California legislature that it has been found that the attorneys are operating with their own financial interest as a priority and they have given the bar a certain amount of time to do something about it. But the California bar cannot bring criminal charges against an attorney. So here we have the problem that the district attorney's office is reluctant to prosecute attorneys. So you have a, a special class of citizen, which is the attorneys that can commit crimes and get away with it. So you have a district attorney's office that's not protecting the community. So you, you're referring to Bonnie DeMonis? 
I would say Bonnie Dumanis would be the one to order Damon Mosler or the Special Investigations Unit to investigate these types of crimes, yes. And what has been uh, the response, or has there been any attempt by the California Coalition for Families and Children to contact the District Attorney's Office? What's the response been? Every, every other high-conflict litigant that I've spoken to has come to the same conclusion as me and has contacted the District Attorney's Office, but was never directed to the Special Operations Unit. I was actually directed to Wayne Maxey of the Family Protection Unit, which is not the unit that would be the appropriate unit. It is the Special Investigations Unit that would actually work in concert with the U.S. Attorney's Office, as in the case of Teresa Erickson, the attorney who's being prosecuted for the baby selling ring. I'm actually calling the high conflict case um, a kids for cash ring. So basically, if you've got two kids, you're getting a divorce, kids are like three and four, it is a cash cow. For this group of attorneys, I'm not saying that all attorneys are doing this. I'm sure there's attorneys in San Diego that actually work for the client. But you have these same attorneys, these family law specialists, that are making a tremendous amount of money off of one case, which should generate an examination. Well, this is, this is quite distressing, and, and again, I went through many websites and I did research on, on this topic prior to this interview, and I found that these types of misconduct uh, situations are occurring uh, throughout the United States. There are, there are instances in Texas, uh, New Jersey, uh, New York, P Pennsylvania. It seems to be a nationwide problem. Yes. Yes. Not only that, an international problem, because I, I saw things in Costa Rica, yes. things in Sweden. It, it appears that the family court system throughout the Western world, for that matter, is out of control. It's servicing the attorneys. It's not for the best interest of the children. It's not to resolve a case. It is actually to deliberately place people that have jobs and homes and college funds in high-risk situations, it's structured in such a way that this litigant is going to be litigating for a period of time, at least 10 years, and during that period, periodically, large chunks of money are looted. Um, I'm, I'm going to give an example of what I'm thinking of. When someone is abducted and the thief takes them to the ATM and forces that person to take $300 cash at a time. That thief knows that they can only extract a certain amount and then they have to wait a couple of days. That they'll take the person back to the ATM and then extract as much as they can without kind of uh, calling attention to the crime. They, these attorneys know how to churn the case so they can kind of remain under the radar, but it's happening in such large volume that it's either, I, I, I don't know how this is being allowed to continue because it's, 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 it is destroying the community. It's destroying the public's trust. It's placing people in financial destitution that shouldn't be. They, they work all their lives, they go to college, they get a job, they're putting money away for their kids' college funds, and then they have to give it all to the attorney. There's really something criminal about that. Now, the last time you were on the show with Dr. Todd Rhodes, you brought documents which indicated many of the public officials involved with this have false credentials. So it appears as though the investigative authorities that are responsible for conducting the investigations also have false credentials. Is well, that it's the case? Uh, um, Dr. Tadros has discovered a diploma mill that is operating out of a garage in Missouri, and you simply send in three hundred and fifty dollars, and you get this uh, diplomat diploma. So that's the one that Dr. Doyne has and Dr. Green has, and. Um, 
apparently a lot of uh, forensics have this, but there are true forensics uh, that actually have true credentials, but specifically the two that are assisting these attorneys, Dr. David Green and Dr. Doyne, had this false credential that they bought from a garage in Missouri. So that's what, and Dr. Tadros has discovered this because he was red flagged a high conflict litigant because he owns a couple of homes. So he has brought this to the attention of the supervising judge and he's been met with um, animosity. And I would imagine that something this serious should be met with concern, due diligence, action, accountability, consequence, jail time, sanctions paid back to the court. Because the court time is very valuable time. So if you are wasting the court's time by presenting false claims and false information, these people should be paying the court back for its time because essentially it's the taxpayers that have funded the court. So with that, I, I want to bring to the public's attention that Dr. Tadros is a reputable psychiatrist right. um, who has made an evaluation that a number of the evaluators in the uh, family court system have false credentials and they're not qualified uh, to make these psychological evaluations. Further, uh, I can say that my divorce case drug on for 11 years, so I personally have experienced how okay. attorneys can drag out these court cases and come to very unfair conclusions. Uh, in addition to that, in San Diego County, uh, we have uh, the National Coalition for Men, which has volumes of data indicating the unfairness that exists with Child Protective Services um, and the family court system. So there's volumes of data out supporting the claims that you're making, right. Uh, right. and I found them very easily uh, right. uh, on the internet. Right. For a number of municipalities throughout the United States and the world for that matter. Uh, we're, we're coming down to our last six or f five or six minutes now. Okay. I want to ensure that you are able to convey to the American people uh, at this point intrinsic information that you have. I want to make sure you give them all the facts that you okay. want to um, I think an important point is um, I actually work for a financial investment firm. So I am in compliance. So if a person wants to invest money, I actually have to advise them of the risk involved. And I have to make sure that they are using risk capital so that if they lose the money, it's not going to adversely affect their lifestyle. It's not going to prevent them from feeding their children. When I went into family court in 1995, I was told that I would be divorced in six months and that I would have close and continuous contact with both children. At no point was there any risk assessment or any warning or any other remedy offered to me that this was going to happen. At the very least, if the court is designed to service the attorneys, they should be required to warn the litigant that once you come in these doors, you will lose your home, you will lose your college funds for your children and their opportunities that you wanted to give them, you will lose your savings, you will lose wages because this litigation will take a lot of time from work. Um, it should be required that this is exactly what it's become. You're a commodity. You will be looted. And when your children age out, the court will then thank you for playing and thank you for your money and send you on your way. And that's very important because I have some statistics here which show that hunger is increasing in America and poverty is increasing in America. And One in two children live, live in poverty or low yes. income. And the attorneys are, are quite, they're doing quite well. So I, certainly this plays an, an, has an impact. 
on these numbers? It, it has an impact. And when I go to court, the attorneys are, you know, Mr. Shulman uh, is, is a family court specialist. He's in probate court. He's a court-appointed minors counsel. He's also uh, a temporary judge in child support services. So even children that are supposed to get child support in these cases, they're not getting the child support. The attorneys are getting all the money. And they're wearing great suits. They're driving brand new cars. They have boats. They're, they're there making a lot of money that they are obtaining through illegal means. Okay, so with that, we're going to have to close. We're down to our last two minutes. And I want to thank okay. you very much for coming. Thank you. Anytime. Uh, we'll continue on internet radio and television okay. with this series. Uh, I just want to point out to the audience that uh, we have statistics that show that 43% of children in the state of California live below the poverty level. And that's determined to be uh, in a family at $44,000 for a family of four. So we, we actually have 43% of children in the state of California living uh, below the poverty line or, or in poverty. And, and so with numbers like this and seeing that one in two people now uh, in the United States are in poverty, we have to look at the impact that the court system is having upon our families. We hear often that it is a, it's a uh, degrading of our moral standards. However, one of the factors that's not being reported by the mainstream media is the impact of the court system. I highly encourage you uh, as a call to action to look at the websites and telephone numbers that are uh, going to appear at the end of the broadcast and to take uh, a course of action. I want to thank you very much for joining us.